Pay Attention, Carter Jones by Gary D. Schmidt, courtesy of Clarion Books, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, Boston, New York. Chapter 2, The Wicket. Quote, The wicket may refer to the stumps and balls placed at either end of the playing surface or to the playing surface itself. Unquote. We were all behind my mother when she opened the front door. The guy was still standing there underneath his satellite disc umbrella, which wasn't doing much anymore since the Australian tropical thunderstorm was blowing sideways now. Who are you? said my mother. He gave a little bow and rain waterfalled off the front of his umbrella, just like in an Australian rainforest. Mrs. Jones, I am an acquaintance of your father-in-law and husband, having served the first for many years and attended the childhood of the second. Is he all right? I assume you speak of the second. My mother put her hands on her hips. She still had a bobby pin tucked in the corner of her mouth, and she put on that look, so she came off pretty tough. Captain Joe's was, during our last connection, well enough. I called him ten days ago by telephone to inform him that his father, Mr. Seymour Jones, had passed away. Passed away? said Emily. The guy leaned down. I'm so very sorry to tell you, Miss Emily, that your grandfather has died. She never knew him, said my mother. None of us did. You better come in. Thank you, madam. Dripping might pose a problem. It's only water, said my mother. Thank you, madam. Together we all moved back, and the guy stood in our front hall, and dripping was a problem. So you're here to tell us about my husband's father, said my mother. You could have just written... Your father-in-law's passing is only part of my message, madame. I am to inform you as well that Mr. Seymour Jones has left a most generous endowment to support my continuing service to his family. I don't understand, said my mother. It seems reasonable to consider that a family with four young children and a father currently deployed in Germany might well stand in need of some aid suited to my occupation. You're here to help out? The guy gave another little bow. Bow. Really? Well, Jack's deployed? He nodded. Jack, she said. Jack sent you. In a manner of speaking, said the guy. My mother dropped that look. She smiled. She started to bite her lip like she does when she's about to... Never mind. I can assure you, madame, my service in this capacity is exemplary, and I would gladly furnish names and addresses for reference should you desire them. Wait. I said, you mean my grandfather, like, left you to us in his will? Crudely articulated, but true in the most generous sense. Like, we own you? The guy carefully tied shut the folds of his umbrella. Young Master Jones, indentured servanthood having been abolished even in your country. No, you do not, like, own me. So, said Charlie, you're a nanny? The guy's eyes opened wide. No, moron. He's not a nanny, I said. Jack sent a butler, my mother said mostly to herself. The guy cleared his throat. I am most conservative about such matters, he said. I would very much prefer to be known as a gentleman's gentleman. My mother shook her head. A gentleman's gentleman, she said. Jack sent a gentleman's gentleman. The guy bowed his little bow again. There's just one problem, she said. There's no gentleman here. Then the guy looked straight at me, really, straight at me. Perhaps not yet, he said, and he handed me the satellite disc umbrella. That was how the butler came into our house. Can I just say, I wasn't so sure about this. I mean, he said he was a gentleman's gentleman, which obviously is a dumb way to say butler. But he could have been some kind of missionary in disguise, or someone selling satellite disc umbrellas, or someone casting out our place for a burglary, or a serial killer, anything. I could tell my mother wasn't so sure about him either. That's why she thought for a long time when the butler offered to drive us to school. When he asked, I whispered, serial killer, to my mother, and she whispered, the fuel pump in the Jeep. And I whispered, probably no ID. And she whispered, raining hard. And it was still raining like an Australian tropical thunderstorm. But I shrugged and whispered, does it matter to you if you never see us alive again? And that was really stupid because now she bit her lip hard. And it was so really stupid because it was like I had forgotten that funeral. So really stupid. 
She closed her eyes for like a minute and then she opened them again and said she decided to go along with us to school and the butler nodded. My mother gave me a look, not that look, but a look that said, don't let this guy out of your sight because maybe you're right and he really could be a serial killer. And then she went upstairs to get dressed. So I was all over him when he opened up the four lunch bags and folded napkins into them, just to be sure he was putting in only napkins and not tracks or poison power or anything like that. And I was still all over him when he finished Annie's hair and got the staples out of Charlie's new socks and pinned back Emily's bangs again because they had already come out. You never know what a serial killer might do to throw you off guard. Ned would have been all over him too, but he was pretty excited, and like I told you, Dashon's throw up a lot, which he did again underneath the kitchen table after he sniffed the butler's wet cuffs. The butler started to wipe it up. I didn't need to be all over him while he was doing that. And when my mother came down and saw him under the kitchen table, she said he didn't come across the Atlantic clean up after a dog. And he said, Madame, the parameters of my duties are wide ranging. So my mother let him take care of Ned's throw up. And then we all went outside, sort of crowded together under the satellite disc umbrella, which I was still holding. My mother got in front and the four of us squeezed in the back and we drove to school in the butler's car, which was big and long and purple, like an eggplant. It had white-rimmed tires. It had running boards. On the front it had a chrome statue of someone who looked like she would be pretty cold in a stiff wind. It had pale yellow seats made of soft leather. And it also had, according to the butler, a properly placed steering mechanism. Even though it sure looked wrong to me. So that's what we drove into school instead of the jeep. When we dropped Annie off at the fifth grade door, the butler got out of the car, came around in the Australian tropical thunderstorm with a satellite disc umbrella, opened the passenger door, and said, Miss Anne, make good decisions, and remember who you are. I will, she said. My mother watched her run into the building. I could have sworn I put her hair in two braids, she said. She preferred the one, said the butler. When we dropped Charlie off, the butler opened the door and said, Miss Charlotte, make good decisions and remember who you are. And Charlie held up her foot to show the butler she was wearing her new bright yellow socks. My mother told her to cut it out and get inside before she got soaked. When we dropped Emily off, the butler opened the door and said, Miss Emily, make good decisions and remember who you are. And Emily asked if the butler was going to pick us up in his purple car after school. No, I said. My mother said, watch for the jeep. Then we drove to the middle school building, and while the butler got out of the car, I got out too, before he could open my door. But he stood at the curb with his satellite disc umbrella in the Australian tropical thunderstorm. The rain was splashing off the running boards, and he took off his bowler and said, Make good decisions and remember who you are, young Master Jones. He put his bowler back on. You think I'm going to forget who I am? I said. You are entering middle school now, he said. I think it quite likely. Then he opened his door, folded his umbrella, and got inside again. He drove off with my mother in the seat beside him. For a moment, I wondered if I would ever see her again. I checked my front parquet for the green marble. Then Billy Bolt came up to me and he said, Who is that? Our butler, I said. You have a butler? The marble was there. So, I said. He watched the purple car pull in front of a bus and drive away in the rain. His car looks like an eggplant, said Billy Colt. Yup. Andy looks like a missionary. Yup, I said. Or a serial killer. That too. Then we went inside to start our first day of sixth grade. End of chapter two.